If you're buying rental property and you're purchasing them based off of the traditional 1% rule of thumb, you know, the one that has been made popular and talked about a lot on bigger pockets, and if your goal is financial freedom, then I think you're in for a very long slog following the traditional 1% rule. I also think that there is a much more efficient new 1% rule that I've come up with that I follow to purchase every property that I buy now. And I think if you follow this new 1% rule, it's going to almost guaranteed get you to financial freedom much, much quicker if you're buying all your properties based on this new 1% rule. So in this video, I'm gonna explain what the old 1%, the traditional 1% rule is, which is kind of scary that a lot of people aren't even hitting the old 1% rule, let alone the new 1% rule. So I'm gonna explain what that is. Then I'm gonna explain what the new 1% rule is that I recommend you target when you're purchasing properties. And then I'm gonna show you how easy it is to find properties that meet this 1% rule. First off, I'm gonna explain how the traditional 1% rule works that many of you might be familiar with or have some sort of idea about at this point. So I'm gonna switch over to my whiteboard here and the traditional 1% rule states that if you own a property that brings in $1,000 a month in rent, then you can invest up to $100,000, which is approximately 1% of the purchase price. So you should be bringing in 1% gross on a monthly basis. And I think this rule is pretty gross, if you ask me. Um, <laughs> so you can do the math and say, okay, if you bought in an area where, you know, you bought a three bedroom, one bath house that brings in $2,000 a month in rent, then you can invest up to $200,000 into that property between the purchase and any improvements. And again, that's 1%. The reason I don't like this rule that much is because it deals with gross numbers, which I don't think um, really matter that much. And the, the concept behind this is if you bring in $1,000 gross, then once you take out your expenses, like your mortgage, your taxes, and your insurance, and then any set aside for vacancy and maintenance, then you should be left over with at least a few thousand dollars a month of cash flow. So in this scenario, we'll just assume that all your expenses are around $700. So you're left with $300 cash flow or net income coming in on a monthly basis. Now, if your goal is to just use these investments for retirement and you're not, you know, you love your nine to five job, you're planning to work there till you're 65 and you're just looking for a place to put your savings, I think this is great because, you know, I think the returns are gonna be better than just investing it in a mutual fund. However, if your goal is financial freedom and you wanna to get to financial freedom and enough cash flow to support your lifestyle as quickly as you possibly can, I think that this, uh, this rule is not super effective. And the reason is, let's for example, say that your goal is $12,000 a month of cash flow. That's gonna pay all your bills and support your lifestyle into perpetuity, um, and that's giving you freedom. If that's the case, and you're bringing in $300 a month per property, you can do the math and realize that that's 40 properties. 40 properties on a Excel spreadsheet doesn't sound like that much. Okay, I'll just start buying properties and get to 40 properties. The problem is, and this is coming from somebody who owned 26 long-term rentals before switching over to this new strategy that employs the 1%, the new 1% rule. As I started accumulating properties, on paper, the $300, most of mine actually were four to $500 per month. It looked good, it looked good on the spreadsheet, but the infrastructure required to support that many doors, because keep in mind, every new property now is a new lease, a new tenant, a new set of issues that could come up, a new set of maintenance tasks. So the infrastructure required as you accumulate these becomes bigger and bigger and becomes more costly. And then inevitably, to get this type of cash flow, typically you're buying in a little bit more management intensive areas, so you'll have a tenant that inevitably moves out, destroys the place, and you've got to use some of that cash flow to re-rehab the place, which wasn't in your maintenance set aside budget, or you'll have the government say that tenants no longer have to pay rent, and they can just sit in the house for a year and not, not pay anything. So it's tough to account for 
all those situations. And because of that, this is a very difficult method to use to get to a place where you actually truly have $12,000 net income coming in or whatever your specific number is. Back in 2017, I went from purchasing long-term rentals, similar to the ones I just described here, to purchasing short-term rentals using this new 1% rule that I'm about to describe. And the difference in terms of progress toward financial freedom was night and day. It, it isn't even close. So I'm gonna explain using the whiteboard again, this new 1% rule and why I think it's so much more effective. So my typical deal today brings in about $4,000 of income per month. Sometimes in the high season that's higher, in the low season it's lower, obviously there's, there's seasonality with short-term rentals, but on average it's about $4,000 a month. The costs, or my expenses on a monthly basis, are around 50%. I have about a 50% expense ratio to operate our short-term rentals. Now you can see that the, the expenses on a short-term rental are much higher. I still have my regular long-term rental expenses like mortgage and taxes and insurance, but then you've also got cleaners, you've got utilities, you've got the lawn maintenance, all that stuff is on you now as a short-term rental owner. So higher expenses, but also much, much higher income typically. So you're left with about $2,000. The difference here is that this is net. It's not gross. And so if there's one takeaway from this whole video that you have, it's that you think in terms of net numbers. Run everything by net because net is what you have left over that you can buy your groceries with. That's what you can pay your mortgage with. That's the only thing that matters. People talk about gross all the time. They say, I have a seven figure business. That's great, but show me your financials and show me what's left over net at the end of the day, because that's really all that matters. If, again, if the goal is financial freedom and living off of these properties. So if you've got $2,000 left over of net income, then that means you can invest up to $200,000 into a property and you're, you're hitting the 1% rule. Now the, this looks the same, but the difference is that it's $2,000 net income, not $2,000 gross income. And so the big difference is when you come down here and you think about financial freedom and that $12,000 that you're trying to make in cash flow on a monthly basis. If you're bringing in now $2,000 per property net cash flow, you can do the math and see that instead of 40 properties, you need six properties to get you to your goal of $12,000. So there's two things that I know I'm gonna catch in the comments here. Number one, people are gonna say, Kirby, you're insane. These 1% net rules just don't exist. There's no possible way. I'm struggling to buy a 1% gross rule and you're telling me that I can buy a 1% net deal? That just doesn't happen. And I can tell you, not only do the 1% net rule deals exist, but our most recent deal was actually over a 2% net income deal on a monthly basis going forward based on all that we had invested in the property. So I just did a case study. I broke down exactly how we found it, all the numbers, the actual link to the Airbnb. Um, so you can see that particular deal and see how it equates to over 2% net. So there's a, a link to it that just popped up here that you can click on to watch that video. The other thing people are going to say is, Kirby, I live in California or I live in Colorado or Arizona or New York and this these type of numbers, I mean, I can't buy a tent off a homeless person on the streets of LA for $200,000. And I get it. I get that that's a challenge out there. And that's why I would say to you, don't buy out there because the numbers just don't make sense. And so it might be a place that you absolutely love. You grew up there, I get all that, but go where the properties are on sale and you can buy a fantastic property for $200,000 in a whole bunch of towns all throughout the Midwest and Southeast. So I'm gonna put my money where my mouth is here and I'm gonna show you on the screen here how this is possible and how easy it is to find a 1% deal. So let's go to realtor.com and let's just pick a state, good old state of Alabama, roll tide. I don't know why it put in Alaska, but we're going to change that to Alabama. It'll let me here. And I'm going to search by state instead of city, which most people search by city. 
but we're gonna search by state. And you can see right up here, there's 34,115 homes in the great state of Alabama that are currently for sale. But I don't really care about most of them. All I care about are the multifamilies. So if you just put on the filter of multifamilies, like I just did, you can see that there's, it went from 34,000 to 206 homes. So there's not nearly as much multifamily, but this is where the true money makers are. So you can scroll through and see where all the multifamily properties are in the state of Alabama. And you can see a lot of them need a bunch of work. Some of them are in better condition than others. A lot of them around bigger cities like Huntsville and Birmingham. Um, and so what you wanna do is just scroll through to find a property that looks like it's got potential as a short-term rental. Um, it doesn't have to you know, be in perfect shape, but something that is deep. So, so here's one in Vincent, Alabama. So if we look on the map, as I scroll over this, you can see over on the map, this is just outside of Birmingham. So this is perfect. I highly advise investing outside of the larger cities, but still within driving distance to the larger city. So it looks like this is less, probably less than a half hour drive to Birmingham. Got some land here, maybe some draws that people would wanna get out of the city and, and stay out here. So let's just check out this property. So this property is listed at 400, 25,000. It says it's built in 2000. I don't think there's any way this was built in 2000. Yeah, this was definitely, if this was built in 2000, I'll buy it for you because this uh, <laughs> this was not built in 2000, but maybe they added on in 2000. Um, but you can see that several of the units, it's, it's a multi-unit property and several of the units need some work, um, but others, yeah, others are in much better condition. So you got this one um, in the layouts kind of different, um, but let's just see how many units we're dealing with. So beautiful multifamily property with a pond, fruit trees, great privacy, lots of improvements. There's two two bedroom units, three one bedroom units and one studio. So uh, as well as a camper spot hookup. So you can, you've got a hookup for, for a camper as well. So that equates to six, seven, no, five, six, seven, yeah, seven, seven units if you count the camper hookup um, we'll we'll not count that but that's definitely another source of income especially down in Alabama where people probably travel with RVs you know through there with RVs all the time especially in the busy season so lots of potential here for lots of streams of income on this property obviously needs some work but let's just plug in the numbers and see how this would work out so here's my vacation rental analyzer and Let's just say this one was on the market for about 45 days. So it's listed at 425. Let's just say we could get it at 400. And let's say the after repair value, if we fixed it all up and put say $100,000 into it, say it's worth 500 after that, which if it's cash flowing like I think it's going to cash flow, it's probably gonna be worth more than 500. You know, investors would pay more than that, but that uh, we'll just put that in there as a placeholder. Um, Let's look at now the property taxes. Uh, it's not showing property taxes. We'll just assume that they are uh, around 4,000, probably not even, but that's 1% of the purchase price. Uh, annual insurance will leave 1,500. Repair costs about 100,000 that we need to put into this. And then furnishing costs for six different units. Um, you know, even though they're small units, we'll put in $30,000 for furnishings. So let's say we're gonna finance it at 75% of the purchase price, um, and then we'll get a private loan for 100,000 to do the, the rehab. So you've got two loans on it, one's from the bank, one's private loan. So now in this area, um, let's just assume that in the high season, you can get about one, we'll say 130 per unit. I know it's not obviously a, a super high rent area, but for the two bedrooms, we're gonna say 130. Then for the three one bedrooms, we're going to say that each one brings in about uh, $100 a piece in the high season, and we could verify this. But since I only have four lines here, we're gonna combine all three one bedrooms together. So that's $300 across all three of them and then a studio will say 75 bucks. In the low season, we'll just say 100 for these, 
for the two bedrooms. And we'll say, yeah, we'll do about 80 per property. So uh, 240, whoops, $240 total across all three units. And then we'll say 60 bucks for the studio in the low season. Now in the high season, let's just say it's 85% occupied. In the low season, it's 50%. So that equates to, actually we'll go lower. We'll go 45% um, just to make it very conservative numbers here. I don't wanna you know, go too crazy with these numbers. I think you could hit 85%, 45%, especially with as low as these nightly rates are, pretty simply. So that equates to $568 on average, across all of them, at a 65% occupancy, brings in $140,000 gross on this property monthly. Now, if you're cleaning five units, you're probably gonna do in the high season, <laughs> You know, that's maybe 30 cleans a month, and then in the low season, 15. Um, it's all pass-through revenue anyway, but it's an additional $27,000 of revenue. So your overall gross revenue is $167,000 on this property, which equates to about $14,000 per month on average across the property. So you can see what your mortgage is based on a 75% DSCR loan and then you can see it with a second loan on it for another 100,000 at 10%, your, uh, your payment's 833 per month. So you can see how the insurance and cleanings all work out. Utilities will go real conservative and say 700 bucks per month. Uh, you know, you're gonna have economies of scale where you're sharing walls and, and you know, furnaces and stuff like that most likely. So, um, you know, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna get some economies of scale there. Lawn and snow removal, it's not gonna be much snow, you're gonna have some lawn. Look like a decent sized lawn, so we'll do 250 a month. Um, and then consumables per unit, um, we'll say about 50 bucks per month in toilet paper, you know, all that stuff. So that's about $300 on a monthly basis. And I always have a maintenance set aside, because there's always little stuff. So if this is the case, purchasing this property, um, and, and these are the numbers, which I think are very conservative and we're not counting in the camper hookup. This equates to um, $80,000, 295 of net income. So you're bringing in about $6,700 per month of net income, which is a 60% cash on cash return. So 6,700, that's the net income divided by how much we have into this deal. So let's look back at what we invested. So we invested 400,000 plus another 100,000, so that's 500,000, plus furnishing costs, 530, plus um, you know some closing costs and that sort of thing. So we'll just say 550. So 6,700 divided by 550,000 means that you're over a 1% deal. And these, I think, are very doable numbers. I don't know a whole lot about Vincent, Alabama, um, but I do, I've run numbers in lots and lots of cities, and I think these numbers could absolutely work. But let's just say I'm off, and I'm off by you know 50%, and you're only making $3,300 per month on a $500,000 investment. That's still a pretty darn good investment. So you can see how powerful this new 1% net rule can be. I mean, if you look at this deal and we're anywhere close to accurate, it's making $6,700 net per month. So if the goal to get to financial freedom was $12,000 per month, then you need two of these deals to be at financial freedom compared to the 40 properties in our first scenario. So if this video was at all helpful to you, hit the like button so that the algorithm can be notified. And then the main thing that I ask is that you share it with a friend, somebody else who might be interested in investing in rental properties or getting to financial freedom. It might be the nicest thing you ever do for them. Also, if you're interested in working with me personally, you can set up a call directly with me to talk through your goals and figure out if my program that walks you through buying a property similar to this, how to find it, how to buy it, how to set it up, might be a good fit for you. So you can go to the link that just popped up below me and there's a few questions that you need to fill out and then you get a link directly to my calendar where you can book a time that works well to, for you to talk directly with me. Good luck and I'll see you in the next video.